Thanks so much, Shauna. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And uh, everyone, I hear there is an online audience as well. So thanks to everyone out there. Sorry, can you hear me? The online audience needs to be muted. So someone on there is, yeah, they're on it. Great. Um, so just, I think probably most of you know why you might do a genetic test on your dog, but there's a bunch of different reasons that different people might do genetic tests on their dogs. Um, one of the biggest reasons, uh, this cute little mixy mutt on the left, um, you might have a mutt and you might want to know what the ancestry of that dog is. So I have a mixy mix and I wanted to do genetic testing. I did that some number of years back to try to figure out what was in there. Um, health. I, did, I chose not to put a picture of a sick dog up there, um, but I found this cute picture of a sick uh, stuffed bear. So health, you might want to know if your dog is at risk for any particular number of, of I don't want to say genetic diseases, but diseases that genetics can have some influence over. Um, there's certainly a lot of breeders who are starting more and more to do genetic testing, and they're both looking for those health markers. Um, something happened on WebEx. That um, I can keep talking, but maybe you guys can figure it out. So um, breeders can uh, might be interested both in those, those health markers that I talked about that people might be interested in. Breeders also do some other stuff looking at genetic diversity and things like that. Um, I'm not going to focus on the breeding component so much today because I suspect there's not going to be a big breeder component to this audience, but I am giving separate lectures to breed clubs and stuff like that more about the breeder component. So if you're here or online and you're interested in that, um, give me a yell. My contact information will be at the end and I can hook you up with that. Um, and then finally, you might want to participate in research either because you are a researcher like myself or actually our laboratory, Dar uh, our Darwin's Arc project, depends pretty much entirely on citizen scientists, so people who own dogs and are willing to help participate in our research. Thanks a lot, Jenny. And who send in samples, uh, DNA samples, and then fill out a lot of behavior questions for us, and we're moving to where we're going to ask health questions as well. So those are all the reasons that someone might do genetic testing. And time was genetic testing on a dog was kind of tough because you had to actually stick a needle in the dog, which involved taking the dog to someone who's capable of sticking a needle in the dog. So you'd have to go usually to your veterinarian's office, pay a hunk of money, and then shipping the blood from wherever the dog is to wherever the research lab is is quite expensive because it has to be shipped on ice. So that's a whole thing. More and more we are moving towards saliva. Uh, for a long time, saliva wasn't doable. It gives lower quality DNA, and so for a long time, labs couldn't handle that. They needed the higher quality DNA, but the technologies that we're using in genetic testing are improving so insanely fast, it's just dizzying. And so these days, we, in, in the lab where I work, we use entirely saliva. Um, even for some of the, the deepest sequencing that we do, we're able to do it with saliva. And more and more, that's where things are going. So that makes it much easier for folks like you to participate because you don't have to take your dog to a vet and, get, and have the needle stick. You can just rub this little saliva collection device around the inside of their mouth. It's super easy. So the biggest problem then that that leaves us with is basically the size of the genome. And you know, when you're in biology class in high school or in college and they're talking about the chromosomes and the genome, it's hard to really conceptualize what this, this huge untamed wilderness it is to us right now. So the example that I'm going to try to use to, to help you, because I, I work with it every day, right? And so I have this feeling of like, there's just massive areas in it, massive areas where we have just no idea what's going on. There's some areas where we think we have some idea, but there's just a lot we don't know. And I think it's really easy for the general public to sort of feel like, well, we know about where these genes are, and you know, we pretty much have been able to map, you know, 22,000 genes in mammalian DNA, and so we pretty have, we have a pretty good grasp on it, right? Um, so the example that I'm going to give is if imagine you're driving across the United States. So that's like 3,000 miles, and it's going to take you several days to do it anyways, possibly a week. Do you need me to do something? Yeah, I just uh, WebEx. Sure. Um, so as you're driving across the U.S. for this long period of time, you're driving across 3,000 miles. So the number of um, letters or in science speak nucleotides or bases that are in either a dog's genome, meaning all of their DNA, or the human genome is pretty much the same size. There's about um, 3 billion of those. So 3,000 miles, 3 billion bases gives you a, hopefully a pretty straightforward comparison. And so that's like, is, as you're driving across the US, that's like 190 letters every foot 
as you drive. So think how many hours, how many days it might take you to drive across the entire United States. And every foot that you're speeding past at 60 miles an hour has 190 letters in it. And that goes on for that whole time across the US. So the, the, hopefully that gives you some idea of it's just, it's just massive. So ideally, what people like me really want to be able to do is to get all of those letters, right? Like I'm a scientist. Those of you who are veterinarians will also, I hope, sympathize with the concept of I want to do all the tests. I want to have all the, all the data, and then that will help me make my best decision. So we can do that. We have the sequencing to do that, the, um, the technology to do that. It's called whole genome sequencing. And it costs about $1,000 a dog. Actually, when I first started writing this talk, it was more like $1,400 a dog. Then they like cut it almost in half, and so now it's under $1,000, and there was much rejoicing at my laboratory. But it's still really expensive, right? So if you're someone who just wants to know what breeds in your dog, you're not going to spend $1,000. And if you're a researcher like me who wants thousands and possibly tens of thousands of dogs in my study, I'm definitely not spending $1,000 per dog. It's just, it's just not tenable, right? So we can do this, and we do do this in some cases. Um, my laboratory actually offers this for people who want us to do this for their dog. Three people have actually taken us up on it. So they actually, because with processing and such, it's more than $1,000. And three people have actually paid us this much money to do this sort of deep whole genome sequencing of their dog, which we were amazed that anybody was interested in that. But um, if you're interested in it, it is out there. But it is not the general solution for most people. So, but it turns out, luckily, that not all of those bases are important. So of the three billion bases, 99.9% .9 of them actually are going to be exactly the same in every dog. They're what makes a dog a dog. So it's only that, that last 0.1% or possibly less that we're actually interested in. We're interested in what's different between different dogs, right? The stuff that's the same, you can just assume that that's there. You can just take that as red. So when we're trying to do something like figure out if a dog is, you know, at risk for a particular disease or what, what breeds are in there, it's just those differences that we compare about, that we care about. So what is that? So what, what are those differences? And it turns out there's a lot of different ways of looking at differences between different dogs. There's some really interesting ones that we're working on trying to get at in our lab right now. It turns out you can have like hundreds of thousands of letters in the DNA, and you can just swip, swap them so that they're entirely backwards in one dog versus another dog. Or they could be just not there in one dog versus another dog. So there's all sorts of interesting stuff going on like that. Or you could have a gene where there's multiple copies of it in one dog, but only in one copy in another dog. That stuff is definitely relevant, and it's definitely doing things that we're interested in, but it turns out to be really hard to get at. Um, and by hard, I mean expensive. So um, there's, there's two technologies that we use right now to get at some of the much easier to, to get at differences. And so one of them, um, I know these as microsatellites. This is what we always talk about, microsatellites in my lab. In the dog testing world, they're referred to as short tandem repeats or STRs. Both names are entirely correct. And I try really hard when I'm talking to dog people to say STRs, because that's what they know them as. But it's possible during this talk I will slip up and say microsats. Um, but it's exactly the same thing. They're both correct. And so these are both, these are short repeated sequences of letters. So you can see in this sequence um, that it's TTA that's being repeated. And one dog has TTA five times, and one dog has TTA eight times. And so there can be dozens of, of these repeats in, in one particular area. And so one thing that you could do is you could look at a dog and say, this dog has this many of this particular repeat in this area where I know there's going to be a repeat. And I can look in that same location in another dog, and it could have either more or less. And this turns out to be a pretty easy thing to assess. Um, I actually did a lot of this during my, um, of running gels. Gels are how you assess this. I did a lot of this during my PhD program. So this is, um, this thing on the left is this sort of, it's either a plastic or glass sort of container. And you, uh, you mix up this goo and you heat it up so it's really hot so everything mixes together. And then you have to cool it down to just the right temperature. And then you pour it into the container and leave it until it gets cold. And then you realize that you forgot to put in this little comb device that makes those little holes. Can you see the holes at the front part? And you're like, oh, god damn it. And then you throw the whole thing out and you start over again. And this time you remember to put in the comb. And you let it cool down. And then you put a teeny tiny little bit of DNA um, mixed up with some colors, some dyes so that you can see it, into each of the holes. And um, then you hook up uh, some electrodes to it so that it's running an electrical current through it. And that makes the DNA actually physically move so that it moves down the gel. 
And then you have to basically sit in lab and check on it every so often. And when it has gotten to sort of a good bit where it's stretched out enough that you think you can see it, but not too far that it, oh, I forgot and I went out to lunch with a friend and it ran off the end of the gel and now I have to start all over again. I've certainly never done that. Um, so then you have this thing with this DNA on it and you take it out and you put it into this machine and you read the machine. And so that is going to give you something like what's on the right. So those strips of color, well, strips of, of, we call them ladders, on the left and on the right are to just give you some perspective about how far the thing has gone down. And so there's going to be taped up, this the old photocopy thing taped up to a wall of the lab will be like this. This one means it's, it's gone this far, and this one means it's gone this far. Um, but the ones in the middle, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we say that lanes, the seven lanes in the middle, those could be, for example, a dog, and we could be measuring uh, STRs there. And so you'd be able to see, right, that this dog, um, I think this is not going to be helpful for the WebEx folks, but the, for the people who are here, this dog has two alleles that are the same, but these other two alleles here are different. But this dog is the same here as that dog. So you can, you can look at it and, and measure out what these STRs are doing in individual dogs that way. Now, the other thing that we use are called SNPs. Um, I certainly remember I learned about these in vet school. It stands for single nucleotide polymorphism, which just means one letter difference. Um, and so here, for example, you can see the sequence on the top and the sequence on the bottom. There's this one point where one dog happens to have a G and the other dog happens to have a C. And again, there's a bunch of places throughout the genome where we know where these happen. You'd think that because there's four letters in DNA, A, C, G, and T, you'd think that there'd be four possibilities. But as it happens, just because of the way mutations work, there's generally only two in any one spot. So it turns out that a SNP then gives actually a lot less information than an STR. Um, a SNP only gives you this sort of, we'd say, like one byte of information. Is it a C or is it a G? Is it an A or is it a T? Just that one difference. Whereas the STRs that I talked about, because, oh, it could be 12 long, it could be 18 long, it could be 24 long. So there's a lot more information encoded in an individual STR, which is why people used to like them. But the, um, the industry is very much moving towards SNPs. We're very much moving away from STRs. Um, and so why would that be? Because SNPs on the face of it seem to be like they encode less information, so you'd think that they'd be less useful. And the answer is because when I talked about what a pain it was for me in grad school to, to run out that gel, and it's, you know, it's easier for the big companies that do this for testing. I'm sure they're much more automated than our little four-person lab in, in grad school. Um, but it doesn't hold a candle to how automated it can be to, to read out SNPs. So this is a SNP chip in the upper left, and just to give you an idea of the size, you can see a person holding it, sort of similar to a computer chip. And you can load that up with DNA from a whole lot of dogs, hundreds of dogs, um, either dozens to hundreds. And then it can look for different locations. So when you're running out of gel, you're just looking at one location over multiple dogs, or sometimes multiple locations over one dog. But this does multiple dogs and multiple locations. And instead of um, having, you know, maybe you could do a couple dozen dogs on one gel, so this, in addition to doing maybe a couple hundred dogs, can do, some of these chips will do up to 200,000 or more SNPs. So although the STRs have more information, say they have 15 times as much information, um, but the one testing company, uh, UC Davis, has their veterinary genetics laboratory. And they test 33 SNPs per dog. So 33 times 15, 495. Another company, Embark, uses SNPs, and it tests 200,000 per dog. So even though there's more information in an individual STR, 495 versus 200,000, overall, you get so much more information when you're going with these large SNP chips. So then, so now we have these technologies, right, to look at places in the genome where things are different. And ideally then, I would, I would again, I would love to see every single spot where it's different. That would give me all the information that I wanted. But there's hundreds of millions of locations in the genome where things are different. So let's just take a second there to think. I told you that the genome is 99.9% .9 the same between all dogs. And I also told you that there's hundreds of millions of places where it's different. So again, think about what that says to you about how huge the genome is. For me, I feel like I'm an astronaut exploring out of space when I explore the genome sometimes. So hundreds of millions of them. Um, so what do we do? 
Sometimes we know the exact one that we want to find with health testing. This is often the case. So we have this C here in yellow, and we just it's like having a, an address on the road. You're driving across the United States, you're going to stop to see your cousin, you have the exact street address, you know where you're going, no problem, you can get there. Um, sometimes though, it's, you know, if you're trying to look across the whole genome to see about what breed your dog is, you don't have that one spot. You don't know it's going to be at 55 Cle Cleveland Road where it's going to tell me that the dog's part poodle. The part poodle could be anywhere. You could miss it if you don't look closely enough. So then what we do is we're like, well, we know where there are certain areas where it varies. And so we just take this scattering. So we call these markers. The only thing that's interesting about them is that we know that they tend to be different between different dogs, and we know that they're spread out across the genome. That's it. It's not that we know any particular useful thing about any one of them until we actually go and start doing research studies to find out that one of them is near something useful. So more markers are better, right? I mean, this is intuitively, should intuitively make sense that as you're driving across the country, you want to have those bits of information more and more often. So I have this picture. I'm trying to figure out what this picture is. I have one marker. I'm like, well, it's purple. Okay, definitely purple. There's maybe some more reddish stuff in here. Yeah, okay, purple and red. I'm good, I'm good. Okay, well, there, so there's some blue and some green as well, but I think that's probably, okay. Well, so there's also some yellow and some orange, so, but I think I'm starting to get the picture of what's going on here. That would be, this would be whole genome sequencing. Um, this is pretty much where we stand with the markers. We're getting some idea of what's going on. We're missing the whole picture. More markers give you a better picture of what's going on. So more markers, better. All right. So that's basically how genetic testing works in a nutshell. So again, wh why do you care about all of this research stuff? Um, a lot of people really care about what breeds are in their mutt. I don't know why. I'm not making fun of it because I have a mutt and I really want to know what breeds are in her. It shouldn't matter, but it totally does. So how does this work? Um, so you take a golden retriever and a border collie, right? And they each have two copies of each chromosome. So we're just going to look at one chromosome here, right? So golden retriever, all his parents are golden retrievers. So all of his DNA, they look sort of similar, right? Because they, we've bred them to be, so we can say that they're golden retriever chromosomes. So golden retriever has two of these golden retriever chromosomes. Border collie has two border collie chromosomes. You breed them together and you get this puppy that has one golden retriever chromosome and one border collie chromosome. By the way, genetic tests, super good at picking up on this situation. All right, so now we're going to breed him. Let's breed him to a poodle. So you'd think, okay, these are the, this is the animations that we were working on frantically right beforehand. Okay, so you'd think that it would look like this, right? You'd think that sometimes puppies would get one entire uh, golden retriever chromosome and one entire poodle chromosome, and sometimes they get maybe an entire uh, border collie chromosome and an entire poodle chromosome. No, it is not how it works. Um, those of you who have done biology recently enough to remember know that there's this thing called recombination, which was actually happening with the golden retrievers, right, the purebred golden retrievers, but it didn't matter because they were all golden retrievers, so when they swapped stuff around, it was still just swapping between golden retriever. But in this case, you can see that the, um, this mixed breed dog, before he passes on his chromosomes, he's swapping them. So then you get this puppy who's starting to have some stuff kind of mixed up, right? So this is more what it looks like, that you have the one puppy, the puppy that gets the um, chromosome from the purebred poodle, okay, that's fine, but then there's the chromosome that's part golden retriever and part border collie. So what ends up happening Oh, we made two copies of this slide, I do believe. What ends up happening is that you start getting more and more complicated stuff. And this ends up being the reality of what you're seeing. So this is, these are images from Muttmix, this fascinating study that the laboratory work did actually before I started working with them. Um, although uh, Brittany and Kathleen down here can tell you more about it. Um, and so th these are what we actually found in some of these mutts that people sent in for us, that there's, if you look at a single chromosome, there's bits that come from different breeds. Um, and you can see that in some cases, like this one dog here, has some bits on the one chromosome and some bits on the other chromosome from the same breed. So it's not like they're all sitting together in nice, neat bits, right? 
And in some cases, the bits from a particular breed can be really small. So remember what I said about the markers, more markers being better, and that you have this picture, so imagine this is your picture and it's covered up with black, and then you're only getting these little windows onto it, right? So it can be pretty easy in the end to miss some of those smaller ones. So the number of markers is super important. Um, and we, what the breed testing algorithms have to do is to go look at those chunks and pull them together and to say, okay, well, I see four purple chunks, whatever breed that is, I'm going to pull all those together and say, there's that chunk that comes from that one breed. So when you have, this is uh, from uh, someone who I know online, has a dog who is half Australian cattle dog and half Border Collie. She didn't know that for sure. She sent him into Wisdom Panel. They came back, said 50-50. It is super easy for these tests to do this because remember, there's one chromosome that's one, there's one that's the other. You could do that with like one or two markers, right? Pretty easy. This person um, tested through us at Darwin's Ark. This dog this is a typical mixed breed dog. You see a lot of these dogs out there that just have a zillion things in them. Um, we, you can see that this one, we said 22% is things that are such small values that we're not even really sure it's there. 63% we were just unable to say, probably because it was so finely diced little bits of the genome that we just couldn't really match it to anything. Uh, we were able to say Cocker Spaniel and Australian Cattle Dog at those numbers, 6.9% and 7.4%, I'm not 100% sure that those breeds are even in there. So the lesson that I'm giving you here is if there are large proportions of a breed, you can definitely trust it. And I'll give you some more examples later in this talk. If there are smaller proportions of the breed, it's a lot harder to trust it. So again, the more markers you have, the more ancestry you can see. So here's two chromosomes that we're looking at for our breed testing algorithm. We can see, well, it looks like there's three breeds here, right? There's the green, the orange, and the mm, lavender, because um, that's all that we have markers to show us. But if we were to see the real picture, if we were able to actually do that whole genome sequencing and look at everything, we'd see that we had entirely missed the purple. So that's why more markers are better. It just helps you get a better vision across that whole chromosome, because you don't know where that little pocket of poodle or pit bull is going to be. So um, in order to pick a kit for ancestry testing, um, you definitely want more markers. You also kind of want more breeds because if the company hasn't sampled that particular rare breed that's in your dog, they're not going to be able to find it. Um, and it turns out that you do actually have to make this decision. So Mars Wisdom Panel is one of the most popular kits that's out there. They have 350 or more than 350 breeds in their test panel. So that's, that blows everybody else away, the many more breeds. So they'll have all the rare breeds. They only have 1,800 markers, which in my mind is very, very few. Embark, 250, more than 250 breeds, so I think that's quite respectable. It's definitely fewer than Mars. More than 200,000 markers, much better at actually looking across the, that whole genome. Um, just to let you know where we stand with our little research project with Darwin's Ark, currently testing for 93 breeds. Uh, when I wrote this slide, we were hoping to get to 100. I think we're at 98 because a couple of them had to be dropped out. Again, Kathleen's the person to talk to if you're curious about this. She's doing this work right now. Um, we are actually getting between 5 and 8 million markers per dog, um, but I at some point found out we were not actually using all of those in doing the breed analysis. And then my head exploded and I was like, but I want to know what my dog is. I want us to use all the markers. And so uh, Kathleen and I are both obsessively trying to, I, I obsessively, I am harassing Kathleen into doing a lot of work to increase the number of markers that we're using. So those of you who are considering what test to use, just something to know is that we're at 120,000 now, and I don't know how many it's going to be in a couple of weeks, let's say. Um, so just to think it through, if you're driving across that country, you're using Mars Wisdom Panel, it's going to be two miles between pieces of information that you get about your dog. Embark, every 79 feet, you're going to get a new piece of information about your dog. With us, currently 132 feet between pieces of information about your dog, but if Kathleen and I succeed in our quest, then we may be able to bring that down to just three feet between pieces of information about your dog. This is my dog, Jenny. She is a super mutt, very hard to interpret. Um, this is the stuff people really want to know about, so I'm just going to give you another one. Um, I tested her both through Wisdom Panel, but then when I started working at Darwin's Arc, I made them test her as well. Um, and so you can see 33, so a third of her just couldn't tell. 
So we like to say that is super mutt. Um, about 25% of her is Labrador Retriever, and as it happens, I actually communicated with the shelter that I got her from, and they said yes, one of her grandparents was a purebred lab. We know that her father was a lab mix, so that is true. And that 25%, when you see that chunk, you're, it's, you're pretty solid saying we got a grandparent there, that's a purebred. And then we have these bits of German Shepherd Samoyed Rottweiler. Looking at them, because they look like they're all sort of around 12.5%, I find it very likely that she has a great-grandparent from each of these breeds. And that the rest of it is she's got some mixed-breed dogs in there that have been mixing and mixing for so long that we just it's very hard for us at this point to tell what they are, although Kathleen and I are on our quest. This is my other dog, Dashiell. He is an English Shepherd. I would call that a rare breed. Um, we do not currently have it in our Embark panel, and so I just wanted to show you what it looks like when you test this dog, who is 100% a pure breed. His parents are both registered through UKC. Um, but we, the computer algorithm doesn't know what an English Shepherd looks like. Kathleen and I are fixing that as well. Um, but currently they came back with 14% mm, Collie, some Australian Shepherd, some Shep Shetland Sheepdog. So the computer definitely got that he was a herding breed. And so sometimes you'll see this. Um, like I think we don't currently have Malinois in our testing, on our test panel. And so sometimes we'll see a dog come back as like big chunk of German Shepherd, big chunk of Belgian Turverin, and we'll be like, oh, that, yeah, that's, that's a Malinois. Um, so this is what that can look like. So when you're picking the right panel, um, again, more markers is super important, but if you think that your dog has something in it that's pretty rare and you go take a look at Embark and they don't test for that particular breed, then you may consider testing with Wisdom Panel. Um, if you think your dog is super, super mixed breed, then I would definitely push you towards a test with more markers like Embark. Uh, we had one person come to us at Darwin's Ark and say, I'm pretty sure that my dog has some um, flat-coated retriever in her. She had some reason that she knew that. Either she knew that the dog's parent was half flatty or something like that. And we were like, we don't test for flatties, so we can't help you. So that would be a case where you would want to consider testing with a place that actually has that breed. But that aside, I think that's a relatively rare situation. Most of dogs are going to be made up of more common breeds. So more markers is better. That's going to give you a better result. So for um, veterinarians who are trying to figure out how to interpret this when someone comes in and says, my dog is 3% Chihuahua, again, if it's that really small percentage, don't put a whole lot of credence in it. And also look at the test panel it came from and how many markers are in that test panel, right? Because if it's fewer markers, you're going to also give less weight to the test. All right. So the other thing that a lot of people are interested in is, is your dog at risk for genetic disorders? Um, there's more and more tests out there that are able to do that. And for this kind of testing, it's not about being able to look across the whole genome like it was with breed ancestry testing. It's much more that, in this case, we actually know the location, right? We know it's 53 Cleveland Drive. We know exactly where we're looking. And so the more markers question is not a question here. Uh, so there's a couple different ways of going about health testing. The way that was the most common until recently was that you knew a particular lab, did a particular genetic test for a particular disease, and you would send some blood or these days saliva off to that lab, and they would come back with your results. So this person was concerned that um, they had a dog that was in a breed that uh, was at risk for um, degenerative myelopathy, and so they sent the dog's DNA off to this test for a result, and they came back. Remember, you can have either zero, one, or two copies of a particular uh, mutation for this disease, and this dog is what we would say heterozygous, is carrying one copy of the mutation. So this is the, a typical result that you might get from a single test. It can be expensive to send off. You know, these can cost $100 or $200, so it's expensive to send off to test after test. Um, these days, there are companies that offer panels, so they use those SNP chips. Um, Embark specifically has put a lot of the locations that we care about for disease testing, for health testing, onto their chip. And so they are able to look at these particular addresses and say, your dog um, is at risk or is actually has um, the, the two mutations for this particular disease at this particular location. And then they'll say, it's, you know, so in this case, 155, this particular dog was a carrier for one and clear for 154. So that sounds really awesome and like this is a super healthy dog. But the thing about these panels is that they are not, they can't be individualized per, per what you actually care about. So a lot of these tests are for 
diseases that either really only happen in a few breeds or for diseases that have only been mapped in a few breeds and it's possible that this gene causes it in this, in this breed but this other gene sort of in the same pathway that they interact, this other gene might cause it in a different breed. So it's very important when you read this through not to say there's 155 things that could have been wrong with this dog and only one actually is. It's important to actually do your research and think through what are the diseases that actually happen in this breed, how many of these tests have been tested in this breed, and then so there may be a subset of just 10 tests that you actually care about from this panel. Doesn't mean the panel's not worthwhile. If you send off for those 10 tests individually, it might cost you a lot more money than getting this panel. But the other thing is that on the internet, you'll see breeders advertising, my dog is 100% is clear for 155 genetic conditions, and that sounds really nice. But it's important also to, to take it in the context of maybe there were only 10 of those that could actually have been a problem in your breed. And so if I see someone saying something like that, I want to think through, do they really understand what the genetic testing means? Because I want to know that this breeder understands uh, what their dog is actually for, at risk for when they breed it. Or are they perhaps knowing what it means and they are engaging in slightly misleading marketing, which is also something I would want to know. Um, or maybe there's some more benign reason for it. The other thing I want to say about the health testing is that it's completely unregulated in animals. And so a lot of you may remember some number of years ago that when 23andMe came out with health testing for people, it was very much this kind of thing, that they had these panels, you'd send them some, um, I think it was saliva at the time, and they would test you and then they'd give you your results. And then people were coming back with things like, oh my God, I'm at risk for breast cancer, I'm going to have a double mastectomy. Um, and it was, it was very hard for people without a great depth of knowledge of how these tests work to know how to interpret these tests. And this is, so the FDA came and said, no, 23andMe, we have to really work through this and make sure that there are ways for people to deal with this. And so 23andMe is starting to do more of those tests now. There's also genetic counselors out there for humans. So if you were to do one of these tests, you were to be concerned about the results, you could go to your doctor and say, could you refer to me to someone who has this knowledge? You could go talk to them and they could say, well, in the case of that particular disease, only this percent of people who have that marker actually get the disease, right? It's not 100%. And sometimes it can be pretty low. What happens is that researchers like me do studies because we want to figure things out. So my lab might do a study in trying to figure out um, what the markers are that cause osteosarcoma in large breed dogs. And we might do a study using these markers scattered across the genome and we find one that has an association and we're like, this is great. And in our minds, what we're saying is, when we publish this, we're giving information out there to other researchers in the hope that they're going to take this information and go do more tests in order to figure out what's actually going on with these dogs. What we're not saying is this marker is 100% and means that 100% of these dogs are going to get osteosarcoma. But what's starting to happen is that genetic testing companies are taking these, these articles that are published with the intention of furthering research and they're turning them into genetic tests. And then people are taking the results and saying, oh God, my dog is definitely going to get this disease. And it is happening. So I know a veterinarian who works at Angel, had a dog come in, not to her, but to someone else at Angel, a pug. Um, the dog had some signs of degenerative myelopathy, which is a fatal, uh, sort of long, slow, and ultimately fatal disease, really horrible disease. Dog had some signs of it. The owner had done an online genetic test, found that the dog did have um, two mutations for that disease. So the dog may have had DM. The dog may also have not had DM. There are a lot of dogs that have two mutations for that disease that never end up developing that disease. The owner didn't understand that, and the veterinarian that they were talking to didn't have this depth of understanding about what this particular test meant, and so that, that veterinarian wasn't able to talk the owner down, and the dog was euthanized. So it's very possible that this dog did not need to be euthanized, and that further uh, clinical testing could have given some more information for the owner to make a different decision. So um, something to think about. My, uh, my boss, Eleanor Carlson, and um, the veterinarian that I was talking about, Lisa Moses, published a really interesting commentary in Nature recently about all of the problems with some of these testing, some of these online tests, and calling for some regulation and just some of the industry getting together and setting some standards. 
And that reference is there on the screen right there if you guys are interested in following up on that. So if you do some of these genetic tests on your dog and your dog comes back positive, please do not panic. Please do not assume that your dog is definitely going to get this disease. Um, a lot of the tests will say, please go talk to your veterinarian about what to do. Please do not also assume that a general practice veterinarian will understand what this particular test means. Some tests are taught in veterinary school. I'll cover one of those in a second. A lot of these tests are very new and are not covered in veterinary school. Your veterinarian may have no idea how to interpret these test results. Your best bet is to call the company and who did the test for you and to say, I need some more information. Do you have a veterinary geneticist on staff that I can talk to? If these companies are responsible companies, the ones that I trust, will have a veterinary geneticist who will be very happy to either email or sometimes even get on the phone with you and talk you through exactly what the test means. You can then take that information to your veterinarian, work with your veterinarian then to decide, do I want to do some more clinical tests to see if my dog actually has this disease? Um, just a quick note that some things that other people can test for are coat color genetics. That can be a lot of fun. This dog's black, but does he have perhaps a recessive allele for, for brown? You know, could his offspring actually be Choco Labbies? Um, oh, sorry about that. I moved this over right before. Uh, but anyways, new information suggests it might be important to test Merle dogs on a specific panel. Really new paper came out just recently. Um, it's understood that if you breed a Merle to a Merle, some of their offspring are going to be what we call double Merles, meaning they have a, two copies of that Merle gene. Those dogs are, the double Merles are at very high risk of having eye problems, often they're deaf. Um, responsible breeders don't do it, but a dog with a single Merle gene can look super cute like this dog and be healthy. Turns out there's a bunch of different varieties of that Merle mutation, and one of them, this paper suggests, may actually leave dogs at risk for uh, being deaf, despite the fact that they're not double merles. So just trying to get that information out there. We don't fully know what it means yet, but it's an interesting test result. Okay, so I wanted to do just a couple case studies with you folks at the end. This is Peggy, her owner. This is a, a real case, name change to protect the innocent. Her owner adopted her from the shelter who told her that she was probably like an Australian shepherd or maybe an Australian shepherd mix. Owners had her for maybe 10 years. Owner has become very invested in that feeling of this is an Australian Shepherd. She even became involved in the Australian Shepherd Club and purchased other Australian Shepherds. So in her mind, this is an Australian Shepherd. What do you guys think? What does this dog look like to you? Anyone? WebEx people can um, chime in, I presume, and Jenny could let me know. Jenny could let me know what they say. Turverin, I heard Turverin. What, what do other people say? Or how confident are you that this is an Aussie? Yeah. So then um, I was called in because I was talking to this woman and she said she didn't believe these results. She says she thinks maybe the dog was mixed up or there was some problem. So what I see here, um, and I think the reason she's resisting this is that the American Pit Bull Terrier is number one. I think if Border Collie had been number one, she might have felt a little bit more comfortable. It's all in how it's presented. I see here that this dog has three purebred grandparents, uh, Pity, a German Shepherd, and a Border Collie. And then that last grandparent was a mixed breed, which may have some collie in it or may not. And there's a lot of stuff in that last grandparent. Um, I talked this owner through basically saying, look at, at the shape of her head. I see, I see pity in the shape of her head. And she's brindle. Where did the brindle come from? A lot of pities are brindle. But I also see that Border Collie is making her look like the Aussie that you thought she was, and German Shepherd, another sort of long-haired breed. Um, I find it amazing, and I'm, I'm just starting to realize this as I've been working through a lot of people answering these questions, the coat color and the coat length and the tail shape are what we look at. And in very large proportion, that's what we see. Imagine shaving this dog down so that she had a super short coat. Let me go back. Imagine that this dog had a super short coat. Would you still think as much Aussie or Turf? A little bit less. So this, this, was, uh, this is Lannis. This is Lannis' real name. Um, his, his owner was happy to let us use his real name. Super cute dog. She tested through Darwin's Ark. Um, she said that this dog was probably a Border Collie Great Pyrenees mix, so I think he's larger than he really looks in this photo. 
So when she got these results back, she contacted us and asked us if the samples had been switched. What do you guys think? So try imagining Lannis with a very short coat. Try imagining him brown. Does he look more like a boxer then? The ears are not quite boxer ears, but they have that floof, right? Imagine them without the floof. So what I said to her is, um, so and that Staffordshire is Staffordshire, um, American Staffordshire Terrier, or Staffordshire Bull Terrier probably. So we've got Pity and Boxer together, coming together to be about a quarter of this dog. All right? So that's 75% of this dog that we have no idea what it is. And these things where you're talking about the coat color and the coat length, they're controlled by very few genes. So I don't find it at all surprising that this dog from that other 75% got coat color, coat length, although this color, it would not be too shocking a color for boxers. You do see boxers with a lot of white. Um, I think we screwed up by showing her a big picture of a boxer. And so here it's, we say, Lannis is maybe 13% boxer. If you look at the tiny text at the bottom, it does say, Lannis has us a bit confused. Our algorithm tells us he's a mixed breed dog. But there wasn't a close enough match to any breed for us to be certain. That's really probably the message that we should have given in big bold letters and not had a picture of a boxer. And in fact, we're intending to change this, but haven't gotten around to it yet because uh, too many things on my to-do list. So, but looking at this dog, I would say this is a super mixy mix, and those things are really cool. I love that these are out there, right? But this is what genetic testing is telling you for our dog. And if Kathleen and I complete our quest to have more markers, maybe we'll get more information about Lannis. I'm definitely going to go look back at him. Um, all right, I put that one in the wrong place. So, but we'll leave it here. Um, if it's something that you guys are interested in contributing to, darwinsarc.org is the place if you want to do some of this research stuff. Um, and help us figure out what's in dogs. You can go sign up there. We'll ask you a lot of information about your dogs, and you can have your dog genetically tested. Um, but I did want to quickly go through some of these health conditions. Uh, butterfly, a Doberman, um, listed as, in this case, being um, having just one risk mutation for um, dilated cardiomyopathy, which is a big disease in that breed. And two, for another gene that gives her a risk for dilated cardiomyopathy. And so her owner contacted me in a panic. Does this mean my dog's definitely going to develop DCM? Can I not breed my dog? What's the deal? So I went and took a look at the paper that assessed both of these variants. And it said, basically, if your dog is going to have DCM, it'll have these variants. 73% of Dobermans that do not ever develop DCM still have these variants. So we would call this a very sensitive test in that it finds it if it's there, but not very specific in that sometimes it finds it if it's not there. So this is one of those cases where it's really important to understand what the test is actually telling you and not panic. This dog, however, is also a carrier for von Willebrand's disease. So is this the same situation, right? No, von Willebrand's disease is a test that is very, very well understood. We think we actually know the actual gene that's actually causing the disease, and that dog actually has a mutation in that actual gene. And so we're pretty sure that this dog, while we know she's not going to develop it because she's just a carrier, we know she can pass it, pass it on, and if bred to another carrier, that would be a problem. All right. So wrapping up, I think a lot of you are going to have to go to class. I'm happy, to, though, to hang out and keep taking questions. Um, if you guys want to see some of the stuff that I put out on the internet, I try to share stuff about dog science on both Twitter and Facebook. So if anyone's interested in that, feel free to follow me. Um, and I also am happy to give these kinds of genetic testing advice um, consultations to people who are interested in that. Um, but questions, do we have any? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Any live audience questions? Because I know some of you guys have to leave, upper right. When are we going to do cats? Yeah, it's a great question. Embark has started doing cats, so you can check them out. Um, my boss, who runs Darwin's Ark, Eleanor, is a cat person. And my best friend, Kate McKeer, who's my coworker at Darwin's Ark, is also a cat person. Cats are absolutely going to happen. I think it's going to be a couple years. It's been hard to get the money even for dogs. Um, so it's even harder with cats. 
The other thing is um, dogs will tolerate you putting a swab in their mouth and swabbing it around, and we don't want anyone to hurt themselves with cats. So we're still trying to figure out if we can use fur or what the deal is. So we are, it will happen. I, I am pretty confident it will happen unless we like lose all our funding and fall apart. Uh, but I don't know when, a few years. Anyone else? Anyone online? No, because I covered everything perfectly. Oh, okay. Well, let's do uh, green first, and then we'll do the person to my left. <laughs> so the first question is, can we use um, genetic testing to drive personalized medicine approaches? That's very much starting to happen on the human side. Um, it's not quite there yet on the companion animal side because, as I said, these tests are just not as well understood on the human side. When you get a test like that for something like DCM, then there's plenty of money and plenty of labs that go in and follow up and try to figure out and, and narrow down and make it a better test. And we just don't have the resources yet on the companion animal side. Uh, we are, the other question was, are we going to start doing this in horses? We, we changed the name from Darwin's Dogs to Darwin's Ark because we would like to do more species, and horses are definitely included. There's some very interesting stuff we'd like to look at, but cats are first. Um, so it'll be a few more years after that. So it just all depends on whether this takes off and we get funding. Um, and then two people, two people down, did you still have a question? <laughs> Sorry, you were pointing at her, okay. Yeah. They're, so she's asking if for the companies that have the lists of breeds that they test for, are they all AKC breeds, American Kennel Club breeds, or are there other breeds as well? And so they're not all AKC breeds. Um, I, most people tend to start with the AKC breeds because they tend to be the more common breeds, but there are definitely breeds that we're all starting to pull in. I don't know for sure what percent like Embark and Wisdom Panel have that are not AKC breeds, but I, I can tell you, so the English Shepherd, which I have an English Shepherd, is not an AKC breed. It's a UKC breed, and it is definitely tested for in Embark. Um, so I know that they are doing non-AKC breeds. And I think everybody's interested in testing all these, different, all these different populations, and so no one wants to limit themselves to AKC breeds. They just tend to be the easiest to get hold of. Does this, are we using this data to look at how dogs evolved from wolves? Um, yes, we are. So there's a fascinating project going on in our laboratory run by Dr. Catherine Lord, looking at the differences between wolf and dog socialization periods. So she's bringing in some additional information. She's looking at um, epigenetic changes in saliva in puppies. Uh, but then we're definitely, this data is definitely going to provide sort of a platform for her. So as she starts to identify Things are different between dogs, you know, dog puppies and wolf puppies, or she's also looking at different breeds of dogs. This data is going to definitely provide a good foundation for her to be able to go and see, well, what does the actual pattern of markers look like in this particular breed? Was there, yeah, was that your whole question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Jenny, yeah. WebEx. What a great question. Um, the question is, is anyone offering um, education for this kind of stuff, for genetic testing, for general veterinary practitioners? To my knowledge, no. Um, this is something that both myself and Dr. Kate McKeer, who's another DVM PhD in my laboratory, feel very passionately about, that we really want that to happen. Um, in our copious free time, by which I mean none, we are looking around trying to figure out how to put together like a certification program or something like that. Um, but we haven't figured out, we can't do it on our own, we haven't figured out who to partner with, so that's all still up in the air. But we feel very strongly that it should happen and that we want it to happen maybe when we're done with our postdocs. Yeah, great question. Are we just looking in the U.S. or are we looking international? And we started out just in the U.S. mainly because we had problems with shipping saliva samples overseas. Recently, we switched to a different company that can ship overseas, so we are starting to collect overseas now. 
Um, but for sure, it's like 99% of our samples are local. Uh, we would very much like to start assessing the differences between populations in the U.S. and in other parts of the world. Uh, we're definitely not there yet, so that's a sort of a longer-term goal. It's a really big problem in human medicine, where a lot of the tests are looking just at people of European ancestry, and they'll find these markers and be like, oh, marker for depression, fixed. And then you start looking, oh, when you look in East Asian ancestry, it's totally different. Um, and so this is something that the human world is just starting to recognize that different populations have different genetics. And so we do recognize that it's important, um, but it's, you know, baby steps at this point. So. Okay, one more from WebEx, and then I'll get you in the back. Go ahead, Jenny. Do I think in the future that this could become a mandatory process for purebred breeders so that they can avoid um, basically breeding, you know, for unhealthy, you know, for genetically unhealthy dogs? I don't know. Um, I know that the breed clubs, I'm, I'm trying to sort of weasel my way into working with more of the breed clubs, and there's a couple that I've been talking to, uh, but just a small number at this point. And I know that a lot of them are really in uproar trying to figure this out right now, and they're trying to figure out what the best genetic test is and how to interpret it and what to do with the results. A lot of the results, as I said, we don't even really know. Like that DCM example is from someone who wants to breed her Doberman, and it is sort of, you know, came to me to be like, what does it mean? Should I, you know, the test results indicate I should not breed this dog. And I was like, well, they all are at risk for DCM. So there's, again, this is something else that I'm really passionate about, that I think there need to be more resources for breeders to figure out what to do. And so that's, again, something I've been doing a lot of thinking about and sort of, you know, how will we move forward? And I think that no one really knows how we'll move forward at this point, and there's a lot of people thinking about it, and it'll be interesting in the next few years to see what's going to happen. And I suspect that each breed club will make its own choice in the end. Um, right there. Is there a role of looking at behavioral characteristics? Yeah, so that's actually um, why I joined Carlson Lab is because the, the current real focus of the Darwin's ARC research is looking at behavior. Um, we are not close to being able to have a commercial test where someone can say how much risk is this puppy out of developing aggression? Um, there is, there are some publications out there that suggest that we're starting to get there. Um